money. Do you look down on the players that lose money? Like I can, I can imagine this scenario where pretending a wealthier version of me is like, yeah, I'll probably lose twenty grand tonight, but I'm going to be at the same table with Daniel and this guy and that guy, and I find that to be worth it. Do you look at that guy and think he's an idiot or just on vacation? It's okay. Listen, you know what? Listen, if you've made a fortune in your life where you can just blow twenty or thirty thousand, who's the idiot? Right. A lot of these poker players who mock yeah. like the businessman. I know this guy. He's like billionaire. He's bad at poker. He comes in, you'll lose a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. People go, Oh, what a fish he is. I'm like, he could buy you 20 times over. He lives <laughs> an awesome life on an island, travels the world, has a hot girlfriend. He does your you know, job for fun. To, I mean, and he's just having fun. So you like it's just like when you think of the bigger game, the bigger poker rules. game, Wall Street or whatever the case may be, you know, they're playing high stakes. So like I don't mock those guys. I if anything, you know, I respect and envy them. Yeah. That's cr- that'd, be, that'd be so fucking sick. Imagine having enough money that you could lose like $115,000 and then be able to sleep that night. Right? Like, just, be like, eh, whatever. It's just like that, that, that story I told you, you guys a while it. back. <laughs> you should try. The first time I lost over a million, it was $1.3 in a game. I slept like a baby. Jesus. Like a solid 10 hours. Was that deep. the case of beer months. contributing to that? Yeah. <laughs> no, sober as a judge after a 23 hour session, burning, you know, just blowing up my bankroll, slept like a baby. <laughs> it's like that story. Christ. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard of Dan Bilzerian. He, he's a big poker player. And yeah, yep. so I was, I was hanging out with Dan a few years ago and he's telling me this story. Um, he was playing at some other guy's house and, and, and who had regular, really big private cash games. And, uh, one of the players had gotten they're just they're in a massive mansion somewhere this this incredible home this this multi-million dollar home and one of the guys wanders away from the game and i guess he really had to shit <laughs> and before he found the bathroom it started happening mm. and so he has shit in little puddles as he has traversed the home looking for the bathroom he's pooped everywhere like, like, <laughs> like, like all over the carpet and then I guess he got a little tuckered out. So he hopped into a, a random bed where a bunch of coats were. And now there's poop all over the bed. And somebody Ew. runs to the homeowner, right? This this guy in this, with this $10 million home. He's like, look, Larry has shit everywhere. He shit in the hallway. He shit in the living room. He has shit in your guest bed. He's like, Larry loses $600,000 here every weekend. He can shit in my mouth if he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good story. You know, it wasn't until the last sentence of that story that I realized Larry's a pretty cool guy. <laughs> I was thinking, what a fucking loser, and then, damn. <laughs> that guy's that's pretty alpha yeah i shit where i want daniel i got a question so 90s nba players genuinely hated each other actually dislike competitive off the court like they didn't like each other current nba players yeah they're competitive but there's a bit of a fraternity that they're all in where do poker players fit in in that s- spectrum is that your dog Taylor? No, yeah, it's my uh, dogs. They're going nuts. I would not have said anything if I knew it was your dog, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, <see? laughs> Daniel Sorry, can bark you. anywhere he you wants to. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So where do they fit? Are, are you and the other players that it seems like your button heads at the table actually friends when you're away from the table? Or where are we? I think you have a combination, right? I would say overall a lot more on the friendlier side, like current NBA. But then you always are going to have royal, uh, like rivalries where people like literally we call it heads up for roles, right? Where like I'm cocky, my ego's, you know, being challenged, your ego's being challenged. We're like, oh yeah, you want to fucking go? Throw all your money down and let's play heads up. Just me and you. Let me bust you. So there's definitely a bit of both. I'll bust all over you. <laughs> bust all over you. Yeah. yeah that's what That'll happens. show me. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I see. Yeah, how about like, I suck like, your dick? How do you like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to me, some of the most dramatic moments are the ones where it like, like a lot of the times, especially in the cash games that I, that I've watched, it, it's very lighthearted, despite you know the numbers at stake and stuff like that. But when I see, in particular, Phil Helmuth get get really tilted, like I, there's a famous clip on YouTube of you 
get him four times in a row, I think, and you're bluffing maybe <laughs> three out of the four hands, and he's just like, I'm too good for you, Daniel, but one of these times I'm actually going to have some – and he just, he just throws away top two, top pair, and you, you've got nothing. <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, eventually you're just going to get me. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and you just pull all of his money toward you, and it's it's, it's funny. But, but everybody loves to hate Phil Hellmuth. But sometimes I watch Mac, my, uh, Mike Mattis out, and I'm like – does he need an intervention? Yes. <laughs> Should someone be stepping in right now? And instead of being like, yeah, Mike, here's another hundred thousand dollars. Shouldn't they be saying, Mike, let's get you a cap to, to fill it in. For those of us who don't know who this Mike character is, is he just always losing heaps of money? Well, it's hard to tell because if I'm, I'm the outside, obviously I'm on the outside looking in and, and there's some editing involved. Like Daniel could probably answer that question better than I could, but. From my point of view, it seems like he takes some rough beats and loses a lot of money that maybe he shouldn't have been gambling to begin with. Well, I mean, listen, you look at a guy like Mike, do you think he has a job? Where do you think he gets his money? He was, he has been a professional poker player for a very long time. Um, he's a lot, he's not nearly as good as he thinks he is. And so when he's playing against really tough competition, that's probably what you're referring to. He's got an old school mentality and a lot of these young guys just like, whip him around. And, uh, you know, he's, he's a, he's a, men he's got like issues, like lots of them. Right. Can you dive into that because like I didn't school. understand it. Yeah, how does old school versus young guys, what does that mean? Okay, there? huge difference, right? So old school players have a way of thinking that's totally different than, you know, the young players. Young players today use software. They're constantly on the computer figuring out game theory. Like we call it GTO, game theory optimal. They're trying to figure mm -hmm. out the best approaches and they're doing things differently based on, you know, the mathematics behind the game. Old school players are a little more fly by the seat of your pants, like... Intuitive, um, and if you don't, yeah. yeah, intuitive, but like a lot of them, don't, if you don't have respect for the younger generation, they're just going to destroy you, right? Like you, you can't be that guy who thinks like, it's almost like I, I would imagine in, in sports, like anyone from this era going back to play poker in 1995 would destroy it, like absolutely crush it just with the evolution of anything. Like we talk about Wilt Chamberlain, we talk about these basketball players from back in the day, like, all right, well, how would freaking Kobe Bryant, and Michael Jordan do in that league? Okay, they score 400 points a game back then. Mm -hmm. You know, it just it evolves. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of old school players are slow to make the adjustment or the acknowledgement that like what worked for you then ain't going to work no more. Have you always been more in your own personal approach, more analytics driven, kind of doing the online, like studying game theory, all that? No, I was always like the feel old school guy. But I realized like in order to stay competitive at the highest levels, I'd need to learn how to use these freaking things. Like you guys were with the mic and all this setting this up. I hate this shit. It's like, I need a guy to do it for me. Mm -hmm. So I hired yeah, a guy. Yeah, I turned like, it on for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, came over. <laughs> I, uh, I hired a computer scientist and another guy who's a pro who understands how to use these, you know, this computer. Because if, you, if you're like new to it, you look at it and you're like, okay, what do I do? What do mm -hmm. I do with these simulations and stuff? So they helped me so I could update my game. But I would say, absolutely, I come from the old school kind of, we call it exploitative play. So game theory, the idea behind game theory is like you do something that no matter what you do, you can't lose, right? So the best way to describe it is you ever played like rock, paper, scissors? Sure. Yeah. Right. So if you were playing game theory optimal, you'd throw one third rock, one third paper, one third scissors, right? Okay. Yeah. So that would be like, if you did that, you know, randomly, there's no way that anyone could beat you. However, there's no way you can win either. Because no matter what the opponent throws, you know, you're going to win about 33% of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what, what good poker players do is they do what's called exploitative play, which they know what the, you know, the baseline break-even thing is, but they adjust to the opponent. So, for example, if I was playing against one of you, and I'm like, well, this guy, you know, he folds when I bet. So I'm going to bet against him more. Or this guy, he always calls me. So I'm going to, you know, make sure that I'm not bluffing against him. So we make adjustments based on the mm -hmm. tendencies we find about our opponents. Mm. Okay. And that was that lesson you just got. That's like $55,000 worth of value. You just got <laughs> if you get actually, if you wow. can get into games with Dan Blazarian, it might be 1.2 million. <laughs> I doubt that's true. I don't think I can convert that into any money. I think it'll cost me 55 grand to see if you're right. <laughs> I like to play high stakes war. <laughs> 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 ah, you beat me again. <laughs> That is interesting, though, and well phrased. Yeah. Still happy to have you as a guest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's really interesting. I, 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 it's one of those things that the more you look into it, like as I knew you were coming on, as I was looking into, you know, kind of trying to learn a little bit more about poker, and 
I I'm in my late twenties and I, until probably a week ago, was still on board with like the, ah, it's pretty much all luck. Cause I've never watched poker online. Really? I didn't really know. Like I, well, I, not all luck, but I thought that a lot of the bluffing, you know, was, you know, not, not nearly as impactful as it really is. 